Well, it's stars in cars. It's a beautiful day. We're near the MCG. So it wouldn't surprise anybody to find out that our special guest today is a Premiership champion, Brian Dixon of the Melbourne Football Club. Good afternoon, Brian. Good afternoon, Mark. Uh, we've got Brian's <coughs> lovely wife, Carmel, with us as well. Say hello, Carmel. Hello, Carmel. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Comedian as well. <laughs> now, have a guess. I'm going to ask Rowan a question to start off with. Fantastic gesture by Brian to make it for the interview today, because have a guess where Carmel and Brian have come from. Um, the Melbourne Club? <laughs> <laughs> no, explain, Brian, because you're no longer Melbourne based. Are well, you? we live in Jamison. Carmel's lived there for over 30 oh, wow. years, and I've lived her, there with her for 13 years. Wow. So uh, it's a long drive, 250k. We're suitably on it. As we do the first lap of the MCG, this and bloke. you get your first two. <laughs> this bloke, five premierships for the Melbourne Football Club. Brian, explain to us how it came to be that you played for Melbourne, because I've got a feeling, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but there must have been some element of, because you're from around Elwood or something, surely St Kilda must have been yes, knocking I, at the door. Yeah, my um, uncles uh, played reserves football for St Kilda, so I was brought up as a St Kilda barracker, and uh, my uh, master at Melbourne High School was Lindsay Thompson, who became Premier of Victoria. And uh, he took me down to St Kilda because I was playing in the first 18 for Melbourne High School. And um, the St Kilda uh, authorities had a look at me and they said, well, you're tied to Melbourne, so don't bother going to live with your grandma who lived in Elwood. Um, you might as well go and play for Melbourne, or if, if you can get a game, which I think they were quite doubtful about. <laughs> that was in 1954 and that's how it all started. Pretty reasonable timing. So they, uh, Melbourne, of course, lost the 54 grand final to Footscray, gave the Bulldogs their first and only premiership. But 55, 56, 57, 59, 60 flags, 58 grand final, of course, Collingwood prevented you guys winning four in a row. And then another one, 64. Like, it's such an incredible year. And when we talk about Hawthorne of the 1980s, but Melbourne, really in terms of flags won and, and grand finals made has to be the most that has to be the most successful era of any club in football history doesn't it Brian? Well I think it would go close if it's not the best but we were 11 years in a row in the final four so that's from 1954 until 1964 we already had six up until 1948 so that made 12 premierships, which unfortunately, since 1964, we haven't been able to add to the collection. Was, yeah. it, was, it, was it all about talent, those sides? I mean, obviously, Norm Smith, you know, the doyen of coaching. But did you guys have that great an edge on the other teams in terms of natural talent, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think Jimmy Cardwell has to take a lot of the credit. He was the chief recruiting person, and he had a band of recruiters, Ken Carline, and uh, two or three others who were under him and they uh, really scoured Victoria for talent and uh, also they kept their eye on school football and they had lots of um, links to various people in various areas of the state and I think that the, the talent selection was uh, second to none. Ten, eleven seasons in the finals, six flags but you weren't able to play in the 55 Premiership. It's an interesting story and it's um. Well, tell us the truth. All right. Well, I was captain coach of commerce and uh, we were playing dentistry in the grand final and the captain coach of dentistry was Mick Aylett. This is at, at Melbourne Uni? Yes, at Melbourne Uni. Right. And of course, um, Mick subsequently became the chairman, president, etc., etc., of the uh, VFL stroke AFL. In fact, he changed the VFL into the AFL. Wonderful man, Mick Aylett. And um, anyway, we had a team meeting on the Wednesday and Smithy had told me on the Tuesday night, now, Brian, I don't want you to play uh, in these university games uh, because mm. we've got the finals coming up and uh, you may get injured and that would not be very wise. So anyway, I attended the team meeting in the commerce uh, faculty and uh, all the blokes were there and they said, well, Dicko, if you don't play, um, we will lose and it'll be your fault and we'll have played 12 games of university football for nothing. And there was a guy there called Rex Thompson who subsequently became a headmaster in the state of Victoria. 
And Rick said, I've got a car, which was most unusual in those days. <laughs> I'll drive you home to Nana Wadding and pick up your footy boots because I left my footy boots at home. So I agreed to um, get my footy boots and I played in the game. I played well and the age next day, it listed Dixon as one of the best players. And uh, so Smithy uh, got a, a copy of the age presented to him on the Thursday night after the Wednesday game. And he said, is this you? And he pointed to the paper and I said, yes. Normie said, well, you're out. You don't disobey my instructions. I told you not to play. So that was that. I missed 1955. And Jeff Case, of course, refutes that uh, story. Jeff says, well, I was obviously much better than Brian Dixon. And I got <laughs> selected on my merits. Now, there's a couple of things about that. That It was a 12-game season. Did you play in most of the home and away games for the university competition? Yeah, I played in all the uh, sure. games at the university. And, and who I was, was captain and coach of Commerce. And who were the teams? Commerce, law, dentistry, yeah, well, medicine, vet, yeah. every, vet, vet every, science? Every faculty that you can think of had a footy team. <laughs> <laughs> now, Brian, you, you mentioned Norm Smith, I mean, yeah. a much revered figure. What, what was the secret to his coaching prowess, do you think? I think integrity. Uh, I think that uh, Norm... Uh, was he had a great saying which was called fair and just and I won't add the adjectives that go with fair and just but uh, he prided himself in being fair and being just um, selection was always based on merit um, and uh, everyone got a fair go and he had a real eye for talent and a real eye for playing people in different positions for, take Ron Barassi for example he started as a half forward flanker and then Smithy decided to shift, shift him to ruck roving, yeah. which at that time was virtually unknown. Yeah. And uh, Barassi, of course, uh, became uh, probably the greatest ruck rover the game's ever seen. Predominantly, who, who were the foes that you would mark as the hardest or your most regular opponents? Oh, I think us? Collingwood and Essendon were our two. Uh, I haven't actually... Uh, Done, I haven't looked at the records, but I think... I think they are probably... I can tell you, that's who you played in all the grand finals. Well, I, yeah, said, I think we should get one thing absolutely straight. There's nothing Collingwood does or did or will do that will compare with what Melbourne does or will do. <laughs> so just, let's get that very the, straight, The gentlemen. enmity runs deep, Brian. Is that, a, yeah, is that a symptom of them knocking you off in 1958, do you Ab think? Yes, it is, yes. Um, <laughs> that was a surprise for the ages. It was a surprise, yes. We were too overconfident. <laughs> I wonder who the easy beats were. Hopefully the, hopefully the lawyers, they deserve to lose occasionally. Now I hope out of all of that, uh, at least you've got some good accountant mates who were able to give you some um, taxation help because you've helped them out. <laughs> Mate, we earned three pounds a week playing football in those days, so we didn't have a tax problem. <laughs> I, I earned more money as a student teacher or a student uh, undergraduate than I earned playing football. <laughs> Who, um, you know, we've obviously heard so much about Ron Barassi. Tough question, but like if you could name, say, the top three or four talents in those Melbourne sides, who, who would you name? Ron Barassi, uh, Dennis Cordner, Noel McMahon, Stuart Spencer. T tell us about Stuart, because he was, he was a brilliant kick, wasn't he? He was a magnificent kick. Uh, a long, raking drop kick, uh, left footer. Um, very strong and powerful, um, and uh, yeah, a great footballer, Stewie Spencer. But uh, actually, yeah. Fitzroy was all right around then as well. I saw yeah, they, they yeah. made the finals in 1960. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Fitzroy had their moments. They lost um, the preliminary final to Collingwood by a kick. All right. Yeah. And who did you play on? Because of course, wing play back then was very much positional play. And often opponents, I mean, it was not unheard of for opponents to follow each other from side to side. Now, we know your great asset was um, beyond ball handling skill, which was magnificent, was also, you were pretty darn quick. Um, did you ever tangle with the Geelong flyer? Well, an alley. No, well, oh, did, Bobby Davis. Yeah. Oh, not really. Bobby Davis was sort of a ruck rover or half forward flanker. Yep. Um, and, uh, I mean, I did a bit of professional running and I... I used to run against Billy Goggin in the in the sprints. Billy Goggin was very quick. Um, Did you ever pull yourself up in those professional races? All I hear from professional foot running is trying to get a better mark. No, I never <laughs> ever did that. Um, I won four gifts and uh, I had uh, a great time being trained at the Caulfield 
race course by a chap called uh, Fergie Speak Speakman, and uh, it was uh, I really enjoyed my experience as a professional runner, and uh, I didn't bother with uh, not, not running to win. I just kept trying to win and uh, won four. So you're not a punter. No, no, I didn't back myself. <laughs> <laughs> so who were some of your, your regular opponents and some of some of your toughest tangles? Well, looking at, at my home team first, I think Bluey Adams would probably be the toughest of all that uh, I played on in the practice games. And then, of course, we used to have match practice. Every Tuesday night was match practice. And Smithy used to um, or, or give us, you know, really tough opponents. So, you know, one of the toughest was Donnie Williams. Donnie Williams could run like a hare, could mark overhead, kick both feet. Uh, there wasn't anything that Donnie Williams couldn't do, and I often picked up Donnie Williams in match practice. Well, you, you guys were so good, you probably had tougher practice matches than regular matches. Well, the top. Smithy tried, there were no free kicks. So, um, I don't know whether that was a plus or a minus, because it, it inclined, perhaps, for you to learn bad habits uh, and not be so much aware of the importance of the umpire but um, anyway that was the way Smithy did it we had match practice and there weren't any free kicks you just go for the ball and uh, get it and uh, play it on either handball or kick and uh, that was the way we, every Tuesday night was match practice and uh, we had a lot of match practice the <laughs> that's these match practices I mean I know sort of through anecdotal evidence there was sometimes some score settled within the team. I mean, did they ever get a little bit rough? I, I can imagine with the competition for spots, it might have been pretty willing as well. Oh, it was absolutely pretty willing, but we were a very happy bunch. Um, one of the great things about Melbourne was our social life. Every home game, we would have a dinner, which was just the players, and the fines were on, so if you did anything that was remotely out of order or if you did everything in order, you'd always get fined <laughs> by the chairman. And then we'd, uh, the club paid for us to have uh, taxis and cars for the girls to be brought uh, to the dance. So we always had a barn dance um, after every home game. So we had... Where, where was that held? At the footy club. <laughs> barn dancing. Not many the, barns yeah. around the MCG. <laughs> barn well, dancing we, at the MCG. The barn dance was the most popular dance. It always went for at least two hours. And often, we didn't have Sunday morning training in those days. But in, retros in retrospect, our training was done on the dance floor. <laughs> you know, after the footy match and you're all sort of tired and sore. But then the music would come on and Mike Williamson would be there or uh, Tony Charlton and they'd be singing and dancing and along with the Dennis Farrington, and uh, we had wonderful bands and wonderful singers, and uh, everyone had a wonderful time and lots of physical activity. Now, and, I, uh, I, I need to ask you too, uh, for our younger viewers, that uh -huh. you are a, a long-term member of Parliament, and I was thinking before, you've worked very closely alongside some absolute icons of this state, and Norm Smith and Ron Barassi are too, but Premier Henry Bolte was another one. Now. The uh, famous Ronald Ryan hanging was a, a huge bone of contention and you lined up on the opposite side to uh, Sir Henry on that one, didn't I you? I did. I was uh, discussing with my then wife Marie the whole concept of uh, hanging and uh, whether or not the state should commit uh, that heinous act and uh, came to the conclusion that uh, it didn't further the cause of mankind at all by killing people. So I rang Henry and said, Henry, I'm going to oppose the hanging of Ronald Bryan. So Henry said, well, good luck to you, Bryan. He said, uh, you're entitled to have your opinion, and as long as I'm Premier, you'll never be a minister. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, so he made, his, he made his position perfectly clear. Well, he got that wrong, though, didn't he? You, how long were you No, no, for? I had to wait till Henry retired oh, to okay. become a minister. I was a minister in the Decamer government and then the Lindsay Thompson government. Well, that, that's an interesting story because, as you said, Lindsay Thompson was... My footy coach. A schoolmaster. Yeah. And, yeah. well, then, in a way, you're the Liberal Party leader, so another form of master, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> the, um, Lindsay was a wonderful man, absolutely fantastic did his Did his son play for... Yeah, Murray Thompson. Yeah, Murray played for Richmond. Richmond. That's yeah. right, he played... Yeah. I think eight or nine games for Richmond. I have yeah, that's I'm good. not doing you know, I've, disservice. I've got a confession to make about Lindsay Thompson. When I was 19, I played in a media versus MCC club game at the Albert Ground. 
Right. And Lindsay Thompson actually played for the MCC. Yeah. And confession here, Brian, my politics are fairly left wing and my parents are even far more left wing than me. <laughs> I went out and, and spent about five overs trying to bounce Lindsay Thompson into submission. He was about <laughs> 68 at the time. I look back on it now and it's very, very embarrassing. Hang on, was he 68 yeah. years old or 68 <laughs> not out? Unfortunately for me, he was about 68 years old. So yeah. I didn't cover myself in glory. And he, he wasn't a robust man. <laughs> no, no, he was very good about it though, Brian. Yeah. So yeah. look, um, we, we've got to finish off though. As, as you know, um, I hope finally, finally schooled you in here. we have asking all our guests to bring along a favourite piece of music. And we've had some very, uh, what's the word? Eclectic? A, 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 eclectic choices. Um, We're about to broaden the church again. We, well, we've had some rock, we've had some contemporary stuff. What, uh, what have you got for us? And the reasoning behind it is superb. This is, Carmel is here for a good reason. Have a listen to this. <laughs> oh, well, uh, Carmel uh, was, uh, and I got married um, some eight or nine years ago, and uh, I thought the most appropriate song to sing to her was uh, Stand Up and Fight. So I sang it not only to her, but also to the audience of our guests at the wedding. And the part that I love most is uh, where I uh, talk to her about being my personal trainer, which is in the Stand Up and Fight song, of course. So, um, did you understand that, Carmel? That it was about being a trainer, not yeah, being a being. Yeah, because yeah. 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 there's other parts of the song where we're going to whack you in the mouth. Stand and up and <laughs> fight like hell, yeah. yeah. Somebody else is doing that. Fight until you hear the bell. Stand toe to toe, trade blow for blow. Keep punching till you make those punches tell. Show that crowd what you know. Until you hear that bell, that final bell, stop and fight like hell. Stop and fight and stop and fight and fight like hell. You never played for Geelong, did you? Yeah, I was going to say, all I can hear is we are uh, Geelong. <laughs> 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 Brian, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've rung the MCG two and a half, three times almost. We have. Would have been fitting to go two more times. But Brian, five-time premiership champion with the D's, and I'm going to throw in a six flag for commerce at Melbourne University. <laughs> Stuck it right up, dentist. Gave him a good filling in, I would have thought. Thanks a lot, Thank Brian. You. Thanks, Thank Brian. you.